Okay, can can folks hear me? Okay, all right, excellent. I think we're ready to get started. Um, my name is Daniel Stoning. I'm a product engineer on the geo enrichment team. I'm joined by Dmitry Kozlov, my colleague, uh, the lead developer for the geo enrichment service. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we appreciate everyone uh, being here with us. Um, Dimitri and I work um, in the business analyst group at, at Esri, the ArcGIS business analyst group. And for those who uh, may not know, the, the BA team builds and maintains the geo enrichment service alongside the business analyst family of products. So geo enrichment really got started as an engine to power the business analyst web application. And um, <clears throat> We're, but we're here today to discuss it uh, in the context of the ArcGIS Python for API. Um, so we'll, we'll show a little bit, go to the agenda slide here. Uh, we'll, we'll do a bit of an overview of the geo enrichment service. Um, we'll do an overview of some of the data uh, powering the service and the coverage that we have for countries and markets around the world. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the core concepts of the geo enrichment REST API. Uh, Dimitri will show a demo of using the geo enrichment module within the ArcGIS API for Python. Uh, we'll do a recap uh, at the end, and then we'll open it up for questions. So that's uh, kind of the outline of the agenda. So the geo enrichment service, the, the, the act of enriching something can really be described as enhancing your existing data. So you know, on the slide here, we, we have some, some categories of the data that's available in geo enrichment. So for demographics, we have uh, population, households, um, <clears throat> age, and, and spending. Uh, there are uh, attributes for consumer behaviors, educational attainment, employment. There are over 13,000 attributes in the US that you can browse through and uh, append to your data, essentially. Um, so if, if I just hop out of the slide really quick and we can, we can show what this looks like in the most basic sense. So if I, I'm here in the map viewer and if I do a search for Palm Springs, we can go ahead and uh, add this point to a new sketch layer. And if I open up the analysis tools, has anyone used the enrich layer tool in, in the map viewer before? couple of hands, okay. This is just a really easy way to kind of um, visualize and, and see what it, what it looks like conceptually to actually enrich something. So we'll use our, our uh, sketch points as uh, our input features. And basically what we're doing here, we're gonna drop a point on the map and we're gonna build some kind of a buffer around that point. So we have options for our, our buffer area. We can do line distance being just a standard ring buffer. We also have uh, travel modes for drive time and walking time, et cetera. So let's go ahead and do a five minute drive time around our point here in Palm Springs. And I'm gonna open up what we call the data browser. And this is a, a component that allows you to explore the data that's available. So we have all of these categories um, within the data browser here that group the, uh, the variables into the same uh, thematic uh, category. And so if I just select these three income variables for uh, median household income, disposable income, and net worth, go ahead and select those. And I'll go ahead and run this. I need to name my output. We'll call it dev summit 2024. Go ahead and run this. Um, this will take about, you know, about five to 10 seconds to run, depending on uh, our internet speeds here. So this is submitted, the job's running now. And when this is, uh, when this is done running, it's gonna show our, our drive time on the map. And then we'll be able to open the pop-up for, for that feature and see what variables we appended. So I selected those three income variables. <clears throat> And once this is done running, we can, we can explore what that looks like in the output. We're running a little slow this morning, just another couple seconds here.
we're on the uh, conference Wi-Fi, so I think there's probably a lot of people on the Wi-Fi right now. Just give it another second here. There we go. So that's completed. There's our area. There we go. So there's our drive time. So now if I click on this feature, <clears throat> those three income variables that I selected are appended to the output here. So that's really the most basic use case of enriching something. You drop a point on the map, you buffer that point, and then you request some, some facts for that area. So now imagine that you have your own feature layers with your own data, um, and you want to enhance that data or, or enrich that data with you know, some of the 13,000 uh, demographic attributes that we have available through the service. You can do that and kind of append that to your existing data to help you make more informed decisions. So we have, uh, <clears throat> here in the US, uh, the data comes from a variety of sources, from the US Census, the American Community Survey, um, and s several other different sources. Throughout uh, the other coverage we have throughout the world, um, we, what we would call standard data comes from a business partner uh, called Mike, Michael Bauer Research. They provide data for most of the countries outside of the US market. Um, <clears throat> We can enrich, you know, different types of areas. So you'll see kind of in the images here, uh, you know, standard ring buffer, drive time, um, but also standard areas like, uh, standard administrative areas like uh, postal codes or, or uh, counties, et cetera. So on the next slide, we can get into that a bit more. The, the ring-based and the, the drive time or walking time-based study areas, um, what I'll talk about on the next slide is how we apportion data to these areas. For, for predefined areas or, or standard geographies like uh, census geographies like postal codes or counties or states, it, it's a really simple operation to request that data. You have, um, you know, it's, it's a one-to-one -one relationship between that feature and its attributes in a table, and that's, that's very easy to, uh, to retrieve. For these, for these non-standard areas, we have uh, a methodology of, of apportioning that data that we'll get into on the next slide here. <clears throat> so, and this is really where geo-enrichment shines and stands out. It's, it's, it's easy to have just a flat table of, of data with you know, attributes for your counties or, or postal codes or what have you, but how do we apportion data to these irregular areas like rings or drive times? And the methodology we use here is called uh, demographically weighted apportionment, uh, also called block apportionment. And this, this retrieval methodology, uh, it aggregates the data to, to our area <clears throat> by intersecting the uh, census blocks behind the scenes. So in our, in our image here, uh, this, this ring is intersecting four block groups. Each one of those four qu quadrants represents a block group. Um, but we know that population distribution isn't, isn't uniform. So for example, in the bottom right uh, block group, most of our population within that block group falls outside of the ring. And so it's not enough to just uh, intersect the block group and uh, summarize the data from the block group. We need to go one level further to the actual census blocks, the smallest level of geography in the census. And what we do is we take the, cent uh, the centroids for each of those blocks, and behind the scenes, we're intersecting those centroids and summarizing the data from, from each census block centroid. That gives us much more reliable estimates than, um, than uh, just summarizing the amount of area in the block group. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of the secret sauce uh, behind the scenes of geo-enrichment to account for this non-uniform distribution of population by uh, intersecting those, those census block centroids. So talking about the, uh, the API, um, we're gonna cover um, a couple of the core operations that are available with, within the geo-enrichment service. One being the enrich operation and the other being the create report operation. So the enrich operation is kind of what I showed in the map viewer. You have an area and you want to find some facts for that area. 
And so we're going to send a request to the server saying, you know, this is our area and this is, these are the facts that we want for this area. And the server will send a response. Uh, typically, uh, JSON is the most often used response. We do have other formats that you can request a response in, such as GeoJS, GeoJSON or CSV. Um, <clears throat> but the JSON response, we get that back. And in the case of the Enriched Layer tool, it's taking that response and uh, appending those attributes to, to an output table for our output feature layer. And so that's Enriched, just requesting facts for an area. So you send the area and you, you send the facts that you want and you get that back from the server. The create report operation is, is a bit more uh, <clears throat> for present, uh, uh, presenting the data. So we have um, a couple of styles of reports. On the left, we see summary reports, uh, also called um, standard reports. And this kind of presents your data in a tabular format uh, in Typically, you would you would request this in a PDF format, and it, it just kind of lays um, the demographic variables out in an easy to read tabular format in, in a PDF that you can share with anyone. Uh, infographics, it's it's kind of a newer uh, format of reporting. It's it's been around for for many years now, but not not as long as the older style of summary reports. And with infographics, we have the option to use iconography and charts and uh, embed maps into our report. Um, and Dimitri will be showing how you can request uh, infographics within a Python notebook <clears throat> using the geoenrichment module. Um, there are a couple of different formats you can request uh, with, with infographics as well. Um, PDF would be kind of just a static image of the infographic. Um, but with dynamic HTML, we, we have the ability to interact with it. You can hover over each element in the infographic. You can click on it and drill down uh, into that element and see more detailed charts. Um, and these are also customizable. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the business analyst family of products. Um, business analyst users have the opportunity to take you know, what we would call the standard infographics that anyone can work with uh, using the Python API and you can put your own data in them. You can uh, edit them to have the, the types of charts you want, the, you know, whether or not you want a map in it, and you have a lot of options to customize these using Business Analyst. So with that overview, I think we're ready to hand it over to Dimitri for our first demo. So let's switch over to five here. Yeah. Yeah, full screen. Yeah, definitely full screen. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, first example I'm going to show is uh, uh, ability to join this big set of uh, demographics data. I'm not, I will not join everything. I will join just few attributes. And I will analyze city parks uh, in uh, city of Redlands, California, where ESA is located. Um, so and I will uh, build a buffer around each uh, point about half, half my mile by buffer and figure out how many children's uh, living in the area. So you can, for example, decide which park should be renovated first based on this information. So to do so, I will import necessary modules, you know, for Python. And um, thanks to City of Redlands, I get a list of uh, city parks. Uh, so I have park name here, I have uh, coordinates and some additional information like park area. So first thing I will I will I will do is uh, I will just to show uh, where all the parks are located. You know, as then as you can see before, the internet is pretty slow here, but it's yeah it's here. So this is all locations. You know, um, you can click on it and you can see uh, some information here on the park. Uh, Next step, I will create uh, analysis areas. It's uh, basically a JSON. Here you can need to specify coordinates, you need to specify spatial reference and uh, size of area. And then I'm going to enrich it with uh, data collection, a age data collection that contains age distribution. It contains uh, by each five years and, and, and per gender, you will see this. In a second. Yeah, it's here. So what we can what we can see here is that you know there is uh, it's just geometries at this moment. So we, the buffers we, we created. So we can see that it's enriched with most detailed block apportionment level, the exactly method what what Dennis just talked about. And you can see here 
attributes, right? So this is this column is for males under age five, and this column is for females over uh, over uh, 85 years old. And you also see buffer geometry here. And in addition, you can see here that uh, there is uh, some apportionment confidence method. It's it's not really uh, area based; it's country based. So it indicates age of statistics based on how many how many years from census it's, it's come from the current statistics because we are projecting statistics. Um, and uh, detailization of most low level of uh, geography. Yeah. So. Uh, then I'm going to uh, join these uh, geometries back to uh, oops. Ah. Oops. Uh, back to um, uh, park records, so you can see park and 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 uh, enrich information. So next step, step I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, uh, calculate uh, just. A, just sum up several columns to get number of children under age 15 living in this area. We do have this column. It's here. This column. And next, uh, I will, I will, I will draw analysis map areas on the map. Yeah, it's here. So this areas we what, what we are trying to enrich. So you have information here, number of children, said name of park on each area. And then uh, I will find just maximum here, it's community park, and located it's in, you know, uh, it has more, more than 1,000 children living around. If you take a look at, at this area on the map, it's definitely coming. It should, it, should, it should be here. Uh, yeah. So you can see where it's located, in fact. So it's located here, and you, you see there is a lot of uh, houses around. This is why it's, why it's uh, so big. Uh, and uh, what I did else, I, as part of analysis, I just download all pictures of the parks. And you can even see how these parks really looks like. Uh, now I'm going to show uh, what you can do. Uh, another enriching capability, you can create infographics out of this. So here I will uh, show, I will show you, uh, th th this is uh, HTML infographics, so you can really see general information like population, median age, and you can drill down and get more information here. Uh, and education information is here. You can also see comparison with uh, state and national averages. And this is completely offline, so if you, when you don't have a HTML, it's all data to show this infographics is embedded in HTML. And uh, this will take some time. You know, by some reason, PDF is slow today. Yeah. So uh, next to infographics is, uh, is uh, oh, it's fast. Uh, show you, for example, we have, uh, in addition to demographic itself, we have uh, POI data. Uh, so here you can see that around the park, there is, uh, this is park location, and around the park there is one bakery and one ice cream shop. And uh, Excel format, what you can also get here, this is how highly useful by customers who would like to put a custom formula based on this. So you, you just have a tables, they uh, stably located, and you can you can just uh, put some additional formulas to um, do additional analysis. That's all in this sample. Uh, yeah, let's let's just kind of yeah. recap some of that. So, <clears throat> the first thing Dimitri did was a POI search for the parks, and, and that, that's something I, I forgot to mention when I was doing the overview of the data. Uh, we we have demographic variables, but also uh, points of interest that you can search for within Geo Enrichment. And who saw the uh, Places API demo at Plenary? Yeah, so the Places API is actually powered behind the scenes by Geo Enrichment. And uh, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a new offering in the, for the developer resources, and it's, it's kind of a, a wrapper built on top of the Geo Enrichment service for working with the Places API. So he got the points for the parks, buffered them. Was that a one-mile buffer you did around the points? Uh, half mile. Half mile buffer. Yeah. 
And then he enriched those buffers with uh, children under 16? Uh, 15. Under 15? Yeah. And then by doing that, he was able to see uh, which park had the most uh, uh, children under 15. Uh, and then we were able to kind of single that location out and run infogra infographics for that area. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Dimitri. Yeah. So uh, for the second sample, I am going to show what, what you can do in terms of if you have a, some custom data. Like in this case, it's only COVID vaccination rates, uh, vac vaccination uh, resistance rates. And uh, you can try to predict why it's, why it's to explain it, why it's happening uh, based on uh, uh, getting a lot of uh, demographic attributes. And I'm, I'm going to calculate correlation between, um, uh, between uh, vaccination resistance and uh, demographics attributes. It's not, not, not pretending to do any good uh, science re uh, um, research, but it's just a sample of what, what you can potentially do with this, with, the, with, the, with this data. So what I did initially, I go to uh, California Department of Health and download their data. They really provided good uh, vaccination information. So they provided uh, uh, information by, by zip code. This is some kind of postal code. Um, in the US, and uh, by date, so they provide, provide weekly cuts. And what's most importantly here we have, there is a percent of population uh, that is fully vaccinated. So I will assume that, in, in my analysis, I will assume that vaccination resistance is a, num it's a percent of population that is not fully vaccinated. Um, so just out of curiosity, I get information for zip code I am living. So here I can see that this is this is chart of vaccination and and uh, at at that moment it's about uh, eighty percent uh, people are fully vaccinated in this area. So I will for vaccination resistance I will just abstract value from one. So here we have a uh, vaccination resistant rates this column. And uh, now I need to enrich all the products. So uh, to enrich a standard geography, is, uh, it's very simple. You can just define it. This, this is JSON object. You say that, okay, this is the five layer. And uh, basically, it's layer ID. And then first thing, I, I, I would like to map this information, you know, uh, what, what, what we have in data. Uh, and I don't have uh, geometries. So geoenrichment also has the capability to return new boundaries of standard geographies uh, across of all countries. So it, it, it's pretty heavy request because I extracting you know um, all, all all zip codes of California, and I'm going to put them on the map. Yeah, it takes some time. So you 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 got some some zip code data from the Department of Health, and you had basically just zip code IDs. Right? Yeah, nice and close. Yeah. And uh, how did you bring that into the notebook? The zip I just I just downloaded a CSV file and downloaded. Yeah, gotcha. And so now we're enriching that data, and not only are we going to uh, append some enrichment attributes to it, we're going to return the geometries for those zip yeah, IDs. Yeah, this, this is most important. What I'm trying to do right now, just to show where where that is located. Uh. <clears throat> So at the same time, I enriched it with five attributes. So this total population, total households, average household sites, total males and total females in this area. So this is quite useful information. Yeah. This is most expensive operation in this notebook. So we are, what we are going to see, we will see color-coded color, color map to indicate which, which zip codes are most vaccinated resistance. They will be in dark colors and blue colors, and less vaccination resistance, they will be in blue colors. Yeah. It's drawing. So here what you can see, for example, there is a uh, desert area, right? And there is a uh, bay area. So in bay area, you see that there is a uh, really uh, low vaccination resistance rate. So most people are fully vaccinated. Uh, so for next, I, I, I will, because, because zip codes have different size, you know, uh, just to make sure that we really rely on some kind of uni uniform uh, size uh, zip codes, I, I, will, I will remove, uh, exclude from analysis uh, uh, all zip codes that has population less than 50,000 people. Uh, and uh, I will show where they are located. 
uh, I mean, where most vaccination resistant zip codes are located. Yeah, it's here. I already find I already find maximum it's it's uh, Bakersfield. So uh, no, 52% of people are not are not vaccinated fully. And uh, now I'm going to enrich the same zip codes. Now it will be faster because I'm not requesting boundaries. Uh, uh, with many attributes, ba many basic attributes for US, we have a KUS fact data collection. So this time it's coming from database, so you can see aggregation method is query. And uh, here we have uh, multiple attributes here. There is one, one thing uh, I would like to uh, request attention. So here you have C CY attributes, that means basically current year attributes. So this is most recent statistics, most recent uh, um, interpolation for statistics. And there is a future year attributes that basically it's, it's five years, next five years attributes. Uh, so here information for 2028. So I don't really would like to find correlation between future year projections and, and, and historical data and current data. So I will just exclude them from analysis. It's, it's quite easy to do, honestly. I will, I will, uh, remove, uh, variables ending with of Y. Uh, yeah. And just to expand on that one, another thing I, I didn't mention is that, um, in, in the U.S., we have our current year estimates and future year estimates, which are predictions of what the value is going to be five years from now. And so he just he just mentioned FY, underscore FY. So if you see that uh, FY on a variable, that's a future year estimate of uh, what that value will be five years from now. Yeah. And uh, here I calculate the correlation between vaccination resistance and... Uh, all the variables from KUS facts that collections from current year. There is actually some variables from previous years. For example, this is total household units for 2000, 2000 and this is 2010. Uh, there is most variables, basically vast majority of variables are negatively correlated. And there is uh, five leaders here, this three and this two. Variable names are not really readable. So uh, to read this, this uh, analysis result, I need to uh, use uh, variable uh, discovery capability of Python API. So here you can get all variables, all data collections, and their aliases. So if you join uh, this information to our analysis, we can see this table. So uh, uh, most negatively correlated variable is average home value. Median is almost the same, and uh, average household income. Correlation is not you know, uh, 100%. Uh, so I, I build a scatter pot just to see how it's look like for average home value. So, you know, what we can tell from this analysis, you know, just, uh, so if you have a house, this cost more than a million dollars and you will be likely vaccinated in this area. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? No, uh, no I, that's good, Dimitri. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Let's switch it over to four. Four. So I'm going to, I'm going to cover a few of the concepts, um, that Dimitri touched on. Uh, in his demo. Um, so you probably heard the term data collections and analysis variables. And here in the, the <clears throat> developer resources, we have a couple of tools for exploring what data is available. So that data browser experience that I showed in the Enrich Layer tool, we don't really have that in the Python API yet. Um, so you, you kind of have to find what data you're interested in uh, but before you run your analysis in Python. And what Dimitri did, he, he found the data collection he wanted, and then he passed that um, <clears throat> in his enrich request in the, in the notebook. So we have a couple of tools here. Uh, one is called the data collection finder. So if I select uh, the United States for my area. And here we have uh, hierarchies. And, and hierarchy is basically a data set. So we have uh, three vintages of the US data that are available in geoenrichment going back to 2021. Uh, the 2021 vintage is based on the older 2010 census boundaries. Uh, so the, the release of the census, the 2020 census was a, a bit late. And uh, when we released the 2021 data, it was still based on the 2010 boundaries. Um, the 2022 vintage of, of Esri US data is, is the first vintage based on the new 2020 census boundaries. And the current vintage with our current uh, year estimates and future year estimates is the 2023 data. So let's let's look at that vintage. 
and this is our list of data collections available. And what a data collection is, it's a group of variables that have some similar meaning. So for example, if I uh, click on the food data collection, you get a description of the data collection and then all of the analysis variables that are associated with that. So it's, it's a way to pass um, one value to get back a, a, a group of analysis variables that have some similar meaning. Individual analysis variables can be found uh, in this data browser experience. So if you don't want to work with the data collection um, to get uh, <clears throat> you know, several, several variables back that all have some kind of a similar meaning, you can drill down into here to find individual analysis variables. So you know, those income variables that I showed in the enriched layer tool, it's, it's the same kind of data browser experience. Uh, there are uh, info icons here for each variable. You can, you can hover on them and get a definition of what that variable is. Um, so what Dimitri did, he, he basically passed a data collection to get the analysis variables back. Uh, and you can also pass an array of individual variables here. And this is really um, the best way to explore uh, the data you're interested in when working with the Python API uh, to find what array of, of variables you want to get back. Um, <clears throat> also in the developer resources here, there are some, um, there are some examples um, for how you can uh, build an app where you can drop a point and, and get a buffer back. So, Here's, here's a description of some of the uh, categories of data. And if we scroll all the way down here, you'll see an example of uh, how to um, build an app where you can do something like this, where you can just drop a point uh, and get a pop-up for, for some variables uh, in that area. And so the, this is a, defile, a default one mile uh, buffer here. So I would encourage you to take a look at some of these re resources uh, and examples. Um, <clears throat> see. We'll talk about the roadmap a bit. So what I was just describing, how there's not really an experience for browsing the data in, in the Python API, we, we want to improve that. And we want to, we want to make it so you don't have to go somewhere else and, and find the data you're interested in. And then, and then, you know, bring that over and, and have to manually input that uh, in, into the Python notebook. So, um, it might not look exactly like that data browser experience that lives in Business Analyst where you uh, drill down into the categories, but some, some uh, option to search for variables. Um, and the other thing we want to uh, enhance that with is something that we're calling a uh, semantic search. And let me show what that looks like in Business Analyst really quick. So if I open up the data browser in Business Analyst, <clears throat> you'll see an option in the UI for finding similar variables. So if I click on this gear icon, and this is enabled by default. And, and what this is, is a new enhancement that we've added to the geo-enrichment service uh, using AI and natural language processing. Um, so what we've done is we've taken a semantic model and when a user inputs a search string, this is one we like to demo a lot, winter sports. Now, if I search here, we're going to get <clears throat> results for, for all kinds of things like uh, <clears throat> downhill, downhill skiing, for example, ice skating, um, things that have a similar meaning to winter sports. Even though uh, winter sports isn't in the name of this variable, the semantic model is smart enough to detect a similarity and return that. If I turn this off and search for the same thing, we'll get back just, just a, a handful of variables that have winter sports in the name. So this ability to find similar variables, this is something we also want to integrate into that search experience within the Python API. Uh, another part of the roadmap is enhancing the way we work with infographics. So if I run an infographic here in Business Analyst, and let's do um, population trends. So 
We, we interact with the infographic in this kind of widget experience. And you'll see that we have a pick list here of all our standard infographics. So you can, you can switch between infographics. <clears throat> and you can um, change the area that you're looking at. You have options for fitting it to the page and export options. So you could export this to PDF or dynamic HTML or Excel. Um, what we showed in the Python notebook is you, you embedded, it was a, a PDF infographic into your notebook, right? So it's, it's kind of just a, a you, you, can, you can work with infographics in the notebook, but you, you, have, you have the option of, of PDF or dynamic HTML, but you don't really have a, a lot of the options that are available in this kind of widgetized experience. So we, we want to add this uh, to the Python API to give you the options to export, for example, and switch between the standard infographics. So that's kind of uh, <clears throat> what we have planned for the roadmap. And uh, here are some of the resources that we covered. Uh, the first link there being the link to the uh, geo-enrichment service overview where um, I showed the data collection finder and the analysis variable finder. So if you're working with the Python API now with the geo-enrichment module, that's kind of where you go to, to find uh, the data that you're interested in for now. Uh, and then the second link there is the documentation for the geo-enrichment module within the, the Python API. Uh, <clears throat> please share your feedback with us, and uh, we can op open it up for questions right now. Any questions from the audience? Please go ahead. You have those on a GitHub repo, right? Uh, uh, currently, no. But we can, but we can definitely put them because there is, there is, there is the same resource. We can, we can do it. Yeah. Okay, come talk to us after. We'll get your contact information and we'll send you an email about that. Thank you. Yes. Yes, we, we update the US data typically in, in the June release of ArcGIS Online. So that'll happen before the user conference this year. Uh, we just released, uh, we just had an ArcGIS Online release a couple weeks ago. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the first release of the year, there are three online releases per year. Uh, the, the first one just happened, uh, it, I believe it was the end of February. Um, the second online release will happen in June before the user conference, and that's when we'll update the U.S. data with our 2024 estimates. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yes, you can. Um, so I, in, uh, in this example here, so if I go back to the data collection finder, when I was discussing hierarchies, so these are the these are the hierarchies available with the US right now. So you can go back to the 2022 data, you can go back to the 2021 data. And the way that looks in business analyst is we have uh, this country picker here, and the US has a gear icon, and these are the three years of data that you can choose from. So when we when we uh, update to the 2024 data, the 2023 data will still be there. You you can you have an option to go back and use that data instead. Yes? Uh, no, th so the, those hierarchies are available within Geo Enrichment. So, what what you're seeing here, this is this is being this is coming from Geo Enrichment. So there there are multiple ways to to request a different hierarchy. So if I go back to uh, the developer uh, resources here, and I go to the Geo Enrichment Service uh, API reference, there is a parameter called. Um, Our parameter uh, use data. So use data is the parameter we send to the geo enrichment service to tell the service what data vintage we want. So the default will always be the current year. So right now that's 2023. If you wanted a previous year, you could you could use this optional parameter to tell the service you want a previous vintage of data. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask someone else. We'll come back to you. Yeah. Or situations where you have a pound, 
city the size of 200,000 people, and you have about a thousand employees there, and all of them want access to infographics. So you have a thousand users that would love to see these demographics about the towns that they're supporting. Every department might need that to do. So thinking about credit, so does what would you? How would you go about presenting or offering infographic kind of level demographic scores of sorts of things for all our Joe's online users? Okay, so the gotcha. So the question is, um, how do you make infographics available to your user base of a thousand plus users without every user spending credits? Yeah. So there, there are options to, um, to export infographics. So, so if I run an infographic here, when I actually create it right here, it's, it's spending some credits to actually create the report. Now, if I export it, so we'll export this to dynamic HTML, for example. Now, this HTML file, it's already been exported. Anyone can look at this now without spending credits. And what you can do is you can build dashboards with, the, with these HTML files. So you, can, um, you could email this HTML file to someone, you could email a PDF to someone, but for a more refined information product, you can embed these HTMLs within a dashboard, um, and then that dashboard can be viewed with a, by, by viewers even. Um, and can I have one follow-up? Yes. The uh, size of the infographic, the geographic scope, City workers would love to have available so that they had an infographic on every subdivision. Some are small, some are massive, um, is, yeah, and you know, some are you know, in the same block, right? Yeah, so I think the, the question is how small can you go in terms of like administrative boundaries? Yeah. So our. Uh, <clears throat> Human enrichment on, say, subdivisions, and there's 500 subdivisions in this city. Some are small, some are small. Gotcha. So the, the standard levels of geography that we offer through the service, here, here's a list of them here. So we, we go all the way up to the, the full country level, down to states, congressional districts, counties. The smallest level of geography that you can map on, uh, so let's do California, select a county, we'll do uh, San Bernardino County. And, yeah, yeah. So you could hand draw a polygon, or you can drill down to exactly what geography you want. So we'll select an individual block group in San Bernardino County, and then you could run an infographic for this area. So <clears throat> block block grouping the smallest level of geography you can map, um, but you can yeah absolutely you can you can hand draw your own custom polygon. So we had the draw polygon tool, for example, in Business Analyst. Um, Yeah. 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 So if so, go, going back to my uh, data apportionment slide here. So I mentioned that behind the scenes we are intersecting census block points. So block groups are the smallest level that you can draw on the map, but the census blocks, the smallest level of geography in the census, we behind the scenes each centroid is uh, used for the data apportionment. So if your township or whatever is so small that it doesn't actually intersect a block point, it'll return zero values. So there's, there's no population in that area. But as long as it intersects one block point, you'll get, you'll get population there. Yeah. Yes, sir. So you're referring to Pro? Yeah. So that's, that's kind of a new feature in Pro where before you run a tool, you have to acknowledge that you've uh, seen the estimated credits, right? Um, that's, that's a really good question. Do you have an answer for that? I, I, I'm, 
uh, for Python API, there is no estimation of credits. You will just get credits. Yeah. Okay. At the same time, if you not using Python or using REST API, there also no estimates at all. So it's some kind of UI help to users to make sure that they not consume a lot of credits. Yeah, just within Pro. Yeah. Okay, so is that going to be like, is that going to become a factor for the Python API as well? Or I don't think I don't think so. I, I I think that's a UI that was added specifically to Pro um, because there are situations where people uh, run an analysis and they're they may not be aware that they're going to be enriching like every. Uh, block group in the US and before they know it they've spent you know tens of thousands of credits and so it's to avoid scenarios like that where people accidentally blow away all their credits I think um, I'm not aware of any plans to add a UI like that into the Python API yeah was, was there another question you had okay go ahead It's it's a good question, and it's when we do the 2024 U.S. data update this year. The, the, the question is, as we update data, will we keep all of the oldest vintages around? And we we haven't we haven't really made a decision yet on if we're going to keep the 2021 data when we update to the 2024 data. Um, we do have some usage metrics where we're able to track how much that data is being used, the, like the 2021 data, for example. And we know that the usage is pretty small. And so we have to <clears throat> do some kind of a cost benefit analysis to see if, it's, if it makes sense to maintain it. Um, y do you have workflows where you want to trend data going back? OK, yeah. Yeah, for 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 the desktop, if you are a uh, business analyst pro user, there is a, a local data install for to, for pro, and 